church. Anybody want to have church right now? Look over at somebody, just tell them I came to have church. Y'all don't, y'all don't, y'all don't, y'all stay with me. This, this is old school here. Y'all, I'm going to wave back to old school. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. I'm a soldier. Every tongue come 
if you can, open your hands and worship. For he is Lord. He is Lord. We're just worshiping our God. translation this morning the first three verses he says shout with the voice of a trumpet blast shout aloud don't be timid tell my people Israel of their sins yet they act so pious they come to the temple every day and seem delighted to learn about me they act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God they ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending they want to be near me. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have been very hard on ourselves, and you don't even notice it. I will tell you why. I respond. It's because you're fasting to please yourself. Even while you're fasting, you keep oppressing other people. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For the next few moments, I want to talk from the theme, Bounce Back Better. Amen. You may take your seats in the kingdom of God. This is the third iteration of this sermon, Bounce Back Better. Interestingly enough to me, when I read this text, I read it over and over again because... The transparency of God is really evident. That God does not mind letting the people know that he knows them inside and out, both in word and in deed. He sees them where they really are. Not the mask they wear, but beneath the skin. All of us wear masks all the time. We wear them so often we even forget they are masks. Because we have one way we are in public, the way we wish to present ourselves to others. And then we have who we really are. And sometimes they don't quite align perfectly. Each of us struggle with the truth. The truth is that there are times in our life when our faith is seeking answers as to why the faith that we think we have is not working. When our faith is seeking answers as to why I'm going through and doing what I thought I was supposed to do, but I'm not getting the results that I wanted to get. I'm going through, I've, I've prayed, I've fasted it. I went to, in this case, temple. I went to church, New Testament. But I didn't get what I wanted. I'm empty around food. I'm thirsty in the presence of water. I'm tired in my bed. 
and I'm asleep when I'm woke. The struggle is real. And, and, and I don't want to act like it's not real because I'm trying. But at the same time, it doesn't seem my efforts are being rewarded. And then God comes in as if to shake them out of their self-pity moment and say to them, you're not what you think you are. There's more that you could be doing than just acting holy. God, God, and, and, and I heard that, but God said, say it loud. Shout it. In other words, get their attention, servant of God. Prophesy so boldly that they know you are walking down their street. Speak it with such a depth of proclamation that everyone recognizes they're not exempt. God says, I'm looking for something from you that you're not giving me. And then you're mad with me because you think that I'm not being your kind of God you wanted. God says, wait a minute. Before you go searching for a new God, why don't you examine yourself? And then God says, I'm going to tell you how you can measure yourself. I will give you the measuring rod that I use when I look at your life. I will let you know what I think when I'm looking at you. I want to tell you my expectation because you are fasting. You are giving up food, but that's not the fast that I desire. I know a lot of people that fast that are not religious at all. They never go to church, but they fast. Uh, they fast to look good. And the reality is, so do we. Maybe it's not the physical looking good, but we don't want anybody else to know we are not what we say we are, so we participate in the rituals of church. Watch this now. He says, I need them to realize that we can fix this. We can be better. We can be something that God would be proud of. We can be someone and some individual person, man, woman, boy, or girl, that God can lift up and laud even in the presence of his greatest enemy, the devil himself, and say, this is my servant right here. But I need to make a shift in you. I need you to shift your focus because, see, as long as your focus is on self-aggrandizement and self-appeasement, you will not see the greater world around you and your participatory role in that world as my hands, as my eyes, as my ears, as my feet, as my love. Because if God is love, then you must be love because you are the very extension and the embodiment in physical presence of the love of God. And so he says, and this is my vernacular now, God says I want three major shifts. This is to them. If you want to bounce back better. Three major shifts to bounce back better. I need shifts. I need, I need complete changes. If you're going to bounce back better. And, um, and, and I'm going to see if I can roll these three out in the next few moments. I don't want to be long because I want you to take this and rehear it later on. 
The first shift I want is I want you to move from empty penance to emphatic prayers. From empty penance to emphatic prayers. I, I know you might not have seen this in the text, but let me see if I can read it in the New Living Ver the Version. In verse five, he says, you humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap and cover yourself with ashes. Is this what you call a fast? Do you really think this will please the Lord? The word penance relates to this, voluntary self-punishment inflicted as an outward expression of repentance for having done something wrong. And we've all done that, you know. We, we've, all, we've all done penance, whether we realize it or not. You know, we said, okay, since I ate this piece of cake, I'm gonna walk farther today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put in two miles. It is, it is a, a self-punishment inflicted as an expression of repentance for having done what you knew was wrong. So you've been doing penance your whole life and probably haven't even realized it. What we, what we have here is that God says to them, no, you need to realize. And, and, and in Jewish prayer sometimes, there's this bowing down as one is praying. And then sometimes people even, and you see them in, in African countries where they'll flog themselves. And some Near Easterns will even do the same thing. Flogging meaning hit themselves as penance, as punishment to, for, for some sin. He says, That's, I don't need that from you. He says, what I really need for you, from you, is to stop striving with people and being mean. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> you, you didn't see that in the text, did you? Verse 4, here's what verse 4 says. What, is, what good is fasting when you keep fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get anywhere with me. Okay, let me help you here. A, B, and C, real quick, and I'm going to put them on the screen at one time. Prayers are interrupted by strife. Prayers are interrupted by selfishness. And prayers are interrupted by superficialness. Real quick, what do you mean, Reverend? I mean, you can't be fighting everybody, cussing everybody out, giving everyone a piece of your mind, and think your prayers are going to be heard. You can't be mean to your wife and then go in your war room prayer closet and pray without having reconciled with her first. Strife cuts off prayers. You can't be all about yourself without ever caring about anybody else because selfishness cuts off prayers. And you can't just simply try to look churchy. Because superficialness cuts off and interrupts prayers. You know, the word hypocrite actually is the word that relates to actor. And sometimes people look at, at church folk and say, that person, you're just a hypocrite. And the reason they say that is because you were acting a part. But it really wasn't you. <laughs> the reality is that prayers are interrupted by strife, by selfishness, and by superficialness. And what he says is, get rid of empty penance 
and enter into emphatic prayers. Those are the kind of prayers that you pray from your heart. Those are the kind of prayers that you don't mind laying before God and saying, God, this is what I need from you. I need your mercy. I need your help. I need you to love me in this season right now. And let me tell you something. That doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. And it's okay not to be perfect. I know that don't sound like you know, church stuff that you got to be perfect all the time. No, you can't be. You're human. So it's okay not to be perfect, but it's not okay not to try. Because some of us give up on perfection and quit trying to be the best we can be. If I don't make the mark, God, at least let me be aiming at it and shooting toward it and working toward it. And as Paul says, pressing toward the mark. If I don't make it, it wasn't because I wasn't giving it all I had. I put my all in serving my God. First shift is from empty penance to emphatic prayers. But the second shift, and this, this might get someone, is to eliminate pretentiousness to empathetic practice. Okay. Pretentiousness is when we we act like we're doing more than we're really doing. So we really could give more to help this situation, but we give what we want to give, even though we sometimes feel led to do better. And the reason we do that is we've lost empathy with those who are struggling. And what, what God was calling them back to was a spirit of empathy that I would care about those that are unhoused, that I would care about those that are hungry, that I would care about the individual who was bound in prison that my empathy would go to them. Because I would remember in my own mind of who I am. I would remember what I've been through. I would remember what, I would remember. It could have been me. Y'all don't, don't get it. It could have been me outdoors. It could have been me with no shoes and no clothes. All alone, without a friend, or just another number with a tragic end, but you didn't see fit to let none of these things be. I, I, I come back every day by your power. I, I, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm, I'm trying to save it, but you keep on blessing me. And you know what I ought to do? Is, is there anybody in here know how to say what? Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for me. Okay, okay, let me, let me, let me, let me. I'm, I'm coming back to it. I'm, 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 I'm going to come back. There, 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 there's an A, B, and C here. Watch this. Watch this. An A, B, and C. Uh, you, you, see, I could have broken this up into several sermons, but I want to I want to encapsulate it so you can take this nugget home today in, a, in one big chunk because there's a lot to take in. The A, B, and C. A is this. You have got to learn to give the grace you wanted to receive. See, sometimes you and I forget that God has given us grace 
that God has opened up doors for us that we didn't deserve to walk through. And that God has blessed and provided for us in ways that we had nothing to do with. That God gave us positions and he gave us chances and he made ways out of no ways. And we have got to learn how to give grace since we've been given grace. Because see, when you know you've been blessed, blessing others becomes natural. But, but 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 then you've got to learn how to live a life of gratitude. Gratitude says, I know what God has done for me. And every day of my life, I just have to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When, when you know, see, I'm, I, I was, uh, when I was born, I was born as, uh, into the projects, Ashman Street. I was born into the ghetto, into the hood. We lived in the yellow archway. I promise you right now, the place where we were born doesn't even exist anymore. The projects were so bad, they knocked them all down. I understand what it means to be hungry. I understand what it means to have a Holy Ghost filled praying mother that prayed up on food. See, this ain't just my testimony. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You know what it means not to have good shoes. You, you know what it means to put on the same clothes over and over again or even get hand-me-downs from somebody older than you. You know what it means to go to school and try to work but yet be hungry while you're trying to do your work. You know what it means to struggle in a classroom and have somebody come up and speak into your heart and tell you, you're going to get this. You're going to learn this. I know you think you can't do this math, but you can do it. You know what it means to have somebody extend grace to you and you ought to give gratitude. You, you Don't you dare get the big head. Don't you dare get so proud because you got a brand new vehicle. Don't you get so proud because you're living well today that you forget where you came from. It hasn't always been good. I don't care if you started middle class, lower middle, or no class at all. Everybody here has been given grace by God. And you ought to be grateful and show gratitude. Here's what the text says. I'm, 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 I'm going to get to my last G in this ABC, I said. See, because see, the, verse 6 says, No, this is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free. Remove the chains that bind people. Share your food with the hungry. Give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. And do not hide from relatives who need your help. You didn't even know that was in the Bible. Because see, it's grace, it's gratitude, and it's generosity. You know, church folk, and, and, and pastors, we're guilty. We're guilty of this. And I'm so grateful to see my fellow pastor back there. Bless you, Doc. Good to see you, man. Uh, we're, we're guilty of this. 
we've got a we've got to operate ministry so we teach the tithe we want to help people become givers to the kingdom of god we teach tithing we teach offerings but we don't teach alms we don't remind people see you can't give your tithes as alms because your alms are what you do at above your tithes because it is an extension of your love of humanity those from the earth just like you and your care for others that's why when Peter and James, when they were going into the temple and there was somebody on the outside begging, what are you begging for? Alms. And they said, we don't have money, but what we have, we'll give it to you. Let me help you right here. The reason the man would be sitting there in front of the temple is he knew that people who went to temple were bringing their gifts and their sacrifices and their offerings. But he also knew that they needed to always keep something to give to the poor and the needy. That it wasn't enough to make the gifts vertical. That the gift needed to be horizontal as well. And that generosity by those who believe in God is essential for God's care plan for those who have suffered the most. If good people do nothing, then nothing good will happen. I'm closing now with the last point. Some of y'all sitting there like, this is different. This is teacher preaching here. Number three, number three. You have to shift from erroneous piety to become exemplary producers. Erroneous piety to becoming exemplary producers. Okay. He says, I'm, I'm going to read it, verses 6 and 7. Ver, at the end of the Message Bible these same few verses come down to the end near verse 11 says it this way. He says, once you've made the shift, he said, God is going to bless you. He's going to make you like, I'm reading the end of the message Bible, verses 6 through 12 in the message Bible, probably around verse 11. He says, you'll be like a well-watered garden. Look at somebody and say, neighbor, watch my garden grow. He said, you'll, you'll be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. God says, if you bless the lost, the least, the left out, and the left behind, I'll make sure you won't run out. You'll never run dry. He says, you, you'll use the old rubble of past lives to build a new rebuild the foundations from out of your past you'll be known as those who can fix anything restore old ruins rebuild and renovate and make the community livable again what god says is look i, I don't want you i don't want this fake hallelujah i want a real hallelujah I want a hallelujah worship that is for real. I want, I want a praise that's for real. I want to thank you that's for real. I want a glory to his name that's for real. 
He says, I want you to become the kind of people that become producers. What do you mean? I want you to be examples. That's what exemplary means. I want you to be examples to the rest of the world of the productivity of those that do the will of God, that I will make you a producer and not a pretender. I'll make you a producer and not a phony. I'll make you a producer and not a pleaser. I'll make you a producer and not pompous. And what I say to God is, I want to live so God can use me anytime and anywhere because I want to be a producer because I realize that if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I wouldn't be here. But because God has been good to me, I stand as a living testimony and I can say, won't he, won't he, won't he do it? Won't he fix it? Won't he turn your life around? Won't he bring you back better than you ever were before? Won't he revolutionize your existence and every time I start thinking big thoughts and start getting proud of my degrees and start looking at other people, I then remind myself, like Walter Hawkins said, it could have been me. Outdoors. Outdoors with no food and no clothes or left alone without a friend. Or just another number with a tragic end. But he didn't see fit to let none of these things be. Every day by your power, you keep on, you keep on keeping me. And I want to say thank you, Lord, for all you right there okay I, I'm done I gotta get out of here that's it right there thank you that's it. thank you come on thank you thank you thank you come on thank you somebody say neighbor I got a reason to thank God an invitation. The doors of the church open. You can come today by letter, by Christian experience, or as a candidate for baptism. I want to extend an invitation. If you're looking for a place to worship, church home, I want to invite you to come to Shiloh. If you're online and you're watching us now, you can get in contact with us. 860-443-6046. I need you to get in touch with me. And one of the members of our staff will get back to you immediately. Our diaconate will get in touch with you. We are just excited 
to invite you to be a partner with us in this wonderful fellowship. I don't know about you, but I really feel like God's calling us to greatness. I don't know about what you think greatness looks like, but greatness is not just getting people in pews because there are a lot of full churches with empty hearts. But greatness is having a church with a heart that gives back to the community and that recognizes that doing so doesn't elevate the church, it glorifies God. And I want to glorify God. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We're getting ready to give. Your tithes, your offering, your capital gift, whatever God lays on your heart. I don't beg. I try to teach. And if you receive the word, you act. You give, you do. There are three ways to give, by Givelify or by Cash App or here in this sanctuary. Let's pray over it. God, we love you. We thank you now for all you've done for us. And we ask God that you bless us. We thank you that we recognize that we are already blessed so that we can be a blessing. Thank you, God, that you not only will receive our gifts, but you'll continue to bless us that we might be instruments of your love in the earth realm. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Put your hands together and honor God. You may take your seats.